Good morning. Welcome to Trolls Road Church Live. I'm so glad that you have joined us this morning. Looking forward to worshiping together. It's going to be a great morning. We're launching our series in the book of James, a very powerful book, a very dense book, a rubber hits the road kind of book about living our lives, reflecting the things that we say we believe. So it's going to be a challenging study together, but I am looking forward to doing that this week and and over the course of the summer. So please be sure to join us each week. I hope you had a great week. Uh, Happy Canada Day, everyone. I I trust you were able to celebrate in some capacity uh, with some fireworks, some cakes, some balloons. My girls and I got to sit out on our balcony and see a parade of these old cars going by on the street, and that was very exciting. Um, We need to be thankful and celebrate this amazing country that God has blessed us with. Uh, But we also need to remember that when God blesses us, that we have a responsibility to share that blessing and to be generous with it. And we also need to remember that we're called to be salt and light. And while this is an amazing country, Certainly, the work of Jesus in our lives and in this church could benefit and bless tremendously the culture that we live in. So let's continue to uh, pray for our leaders and pray for our country and pray for our church and the role that we can play in that. Of course, it is summer, and uh, for many of you that are parents like me, you're thinking uh, summer vacation started for my kids like a month or two ago, uh, and I'm running out of ideas to keep them busy. But, um, of course, with summer, vacation schedules might be taking effect. And I got thinking, maybe this morning you're watching from a different location than you normally watch. So why don't you share with us down below, where are you watching the service from this morning? Are you watching from your kitchen table, from the couch? Are you watching from the trailer or the cottage? Or maybe you're watching in the car. Hopefully you're not the driver, Uh, but um, I'd just be curious to know and uh, be neat to see where people are at. Hey, there's a lot going on in our world, but these opportunities each Sunday to stop and to pause are so significant. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to pause. We're going to focus our attention on Jesus and let him speak to us so we are prepared, so that we are able to not just survive life, but to live life to the fullest and to live life in a way that honors God and blesses others. Thanks for joining me this morning. Why don't you join me in worship as we celebrate our church, as we celebrate our God, and as we celebrate our faith. It's as if we've wandered the desert, travelers without a home, together yet alone in this uncertainty. An uncommon time, unexpected, undefined, binds us, unites us, does not divide us, but reminds us of who we are. A body, not a building, unrelenting, unyielding, persevering, revealing the faithfulness of God. Maybe this virus has started a fire inside us, ignited us, inspired us to live louder, love harder, care deeper. Six feet, six miles, or a world apart. Our calling remains the same. For we are the body of Christ. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise 
Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's redeeming Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither to thy help I come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger Interposed His precious blood Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above.
Sometimes on this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore oh you're in the father's house arrival's not the end the journey is where you are. You never wanted perfect, you just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final. I'm reading this morning from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Well, we are going to dive into the book of James and uh, spend the whole summer exploring this incredible book. I spoke to a few of you this week and you shared with me that it's your favorite book in the Bible because it's so practical and it's so relevant for us today. And you will see that as we unpack some of the themes and the the key words. They are themes and key words for followers of Jesus today in the culture that we live One author I I listened to this week said that the book of James is a beautifully crafted punch in the gut because it gets right to the nitty-gritty of is your life a reflection of what you say you believe in Jesus? And so the purpose of the book of James is to help us be a mature and devoted follower of Jesus in community. So while we'll be looking at personal situations and and reflecting on our own lives, the ultimate goal is for James to help us discover how to be mature for the benefit of the community around us. In other words, how to love God and love others. Now, James is an interesting character. He's the half-brother of Jesus. James would have been part of the family that early in Jesus' ministry tried to get him sort of out of the public eye, wanted him maybe put away off to the side. They thought he was crazy. And here you have James writing one of the most incredible books in the New Testament. James would have been the leader in the church Uh, at Jerusalem, this would have been ground zero for the early Christian church. And when Peter left to do uh, mission work, James would have taken the leadership mantle there. We know that this church faced serious persecution from the Jewish religious leaders as well as the Roman leaders. But there was also a famine and it dramatically impacted Jerusalem. And the early Christians took the brunt of that as well. And we know that the the Gentile churches actually took up offerings for the Jewish church to help them in their time of suffering. James and his church knew what it was to struggle, to face trials. James would ultimately die. He would be martyred because of his leadership in the church and his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, um, the book of James is a collection of several wisdom speeches. And... Chapters 2 through 5 walk us through seemingly unrelated topics, but there are key words and themes that keep coming to the surface. Chapter 1 introduces us to many of those themes and key words and is a bit of an overture to the whole book. It seems to draw on the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached in Matthew 5 to 7, as well as the book of Proverbs. And you will see some overlap and some some familiar techniques that are used. 
But what James is trying to do is challenge people with the counter-cultural reality of the gospel. And so I'd invite you to open your Bibles to James chapter 1. And I hope you've read and been reading through. Uh, it's a short book, but it's rich, it's dense. And each Sunday we are going to unpack uh, some great scripture verses together. Now James wrote, it says here, to the 12 tribes scattered amongst the nations, so the, the Jewish Christians, but this book is a handbook for all Christians who are serious about maturity in Christ. And in verse 2 it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. James comes out swinging right from the get-go. This sounds so counterintuitive. Why on earth would I have joy if I'm facing trials, especially trials of many kinds? Now again, let's remember that James understands something of trials here. He knows what suffering and persecution is all about. Sometimes we forget that when the Bible talks about suffering, it's not really speaking specifically about the kind of suffering you and I endure. Not that that's not real suffering. And not that it doesn't matter to God. But James is literally talking about the kind of trials that could conclude with someone losing their life because of their faith in Jesus. Do you realize there are people in the world today that face that kind of suffering? Those kinds of trials? Someone today will be killed because of their faith in Jesus. There are parts of Africa, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East even parts of Eastern Europe specifically, where you could lose your job, you could be put in prison, your business could be closed, or your very life could be taken. And so when the Bible speaks about suffering and trials, it's speaking to those situations specifically. So if it applies to those situations, it definitely applies to the challenges and trials that I am facing. James is not naive to the hardship and the difficulty that comes in living life, especially as a Christian. He wants to recalibrate suffering. So instead of it being an excuse or a source of complaint or a place where we look around to find someone to blame, he suggests look around and find where God is at work in the midst of your trials and your suffering. Notice how many times in scripture there is a wilderness or a desert and someone or Groups of people spend long periods of time in that wilderness and God meets with them there and God matures them there and they experience the goodness and the provision of God in those places. We all understand that you don't learn very much from success, but when we fail, when we struggle, when we suffer, we become acutely aware of things we may not have noticed otherwise. And James invites us to become acutely aware of God and the work that he does in our life, and the joy that that can bring. Now, suffering is a common discussion for all philosophies and religion. In the Buddhist philosophy, life is suffering. Reincarnation is not a reward. It's a continuous cycle that you try and escape. And so, for them, suffering is something to escape. For a capitalist, for someone in North America, suffering is something to avoid and protect yourself from. If you have enough stuff, or if you experience certain things, or if you have enough money, you can avoid or insulate your life from suffering. I'm amazed when I go on uh, mission trips to other places in the world where people are in serious poverty, and yet... Their love for the Lord just bubbles joy to the surface of their life. And I'm so challenged and humbled by that. But this is what James is saying. Don't buy the lie that your circumstances determine your joy. No, the presence of God in your life and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, that determines joy. And so in this book, we will see how to address and navigate trials and persecution, and suffering. Do you remember Joseph in Genesis, Old Testament, coat of many colors, his brothers sell him into slavery. And he ends up in Egypt in a foreign land. And every time things start to go well for him, it seems like the rug gets pulled out from underneath him. 
But eventually, as he perseveres, God puts him in a position second only to Pharaoh and uses Joseph to save many people's lives, including Joseph's own family his own brothers that sold him into slavery. And when they come looking for food during a famine, Joseph said, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph wasn't suggesting that God is responsible for what the brothers did. Joseph is pointing out the obvious fact that God had not abandoned him and even used those hard circumstances to do something incredible. And Joseph got to be a part of it. Incidentally, he wouldn't have been a part of it if he was still back in Israel with his brothers. You know, when we talk about suffering and struggle, we should never ignore the reality, but don't let that reality define you or prevent you from experience the goodness of God. Well, that's a look at the, the, uh, the beginning of the book. And, and like I said, he comes out swinging it talks about persevering so that uh, w- when perseverance finishes it wor- its work, you are mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is God's heart for you. This is God's plan for you to be mature, to be whole, to be complete. He shifts gears a little bit. And in verse 5, now he starts talking about wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Now, because we have just talked about suffering and struggles and trials, it's reasonable to assume that he's specifically talking about wisdom in knowing what to do in those hard circumstances. In how to, to look to God to give you direction as you seek to persevere. Notice how James describes God as a generous God. He's good. I've said this before, but throughout the history of the world, nobody debated whether there was a God. They debated about who that God was and is he good. And the God of the Bible Our God is a good God. He's a generous God. And there are certain things he loves to be generous with, and wisdom is one of them. And it says that that he's he's not going to say, oh man, I can't believe you're back again. I can't believe you haven't learned this already. No, he doesn't find fault. He's so glad that you understand that you need him and that you've come to him for help. It's important that we ask God because we are acknowledging not only that we believe in God, but we understand that it's God's wisdom, it's God's direction that will lead us on the path we want to go. Now, the problem is that there's a lot of people that say they believe in God. A lot of people say, I believe in God. Later on, we'll see that James addresses those people. But the question isn't whether you believe in God. The question is, do you live your life like you believe in God? You see, there's a name for people that believe in God and they live their life any way they want. It's called deism. Being a deist is someone that believes in God but thinks you have full responsibility, right, and privilege to do whatever you want. Now, people that are deists tend to to desire to be morally good and they they generally have uh, put effort into that. But believing in God... And putting effort into being morally good is is nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity is all to do with Jesus transforming and forgiving and changing us. So what about this deism? What's going on there? Well, James actually addresses it very specifically. Listen, when you ask for wisdom, you must believe and not doubt, because one who doubts is like a wave on the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. What do you mean double-minded? Well, it's exactly what it says. They have two minds. They have a mind that says God is in control, and they have a mind that says I am in control. This hits a little close to home for some of us. Now, in the deist worldview, generally what we do is we say God is in control of supernatural things and I am in control of the natural things. Supernatural things include eternity. They include salvation and forgiveness and miracles. Natural things include things like money, decisions about jobs or school, decisions about how I spend my time, the priorities in my life. 
And you can see already how being double-minded is going to come into conflict with one another. It's going to cause problems. And you're going to have a, a real struggle to determine what's supernatural and what's natural. And who gets to decide. But the ultimate problem with this deism and being double-minded and this idea of believing in God but, but making all the decisions about your life because that's the natural part of the world, is that God is not just the God of the supernatural. God is the God of the natural. He created the natural. Jesus died a, a death on a natural cross, a real death, so that we could experience the supernatural. And so Jesus has authority over supernatural and natural. And in that equation, we need to be single-minded. We need to be focused of one mind, of God's mind, of the wisdom that God offers through the pages of Scripture and in the person of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 25, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And praise God that you and I have access to both the wisdom of God and the strength of God. It's an amazing thing. And so James challenges us to not only persevere when we face trials, but to be of one mind, to be focused on Jesus and to allow the wisdom of God to speak into our life and then to follow what he's saying. So we've talked about God's plan, even in trials, maybe especially in trials. We, we talked about God's wisdom, but also I want you to notice God's wealth. We, we have a real problem when it comes to wealth because we do not perceive it the way God perceives it. The Bible is full, and I mean full of discussions about wealth. Jesus talked about money more than anything else. But it, the, the mistake that we make is we sometimes forget that it's not money that was the issue. Jesus is always talking about what's behind the money, what's behind the economics, Right? He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't store up for yourself things that will rust and moth will destroy and you'll lose and it'll disappear. Store up treasure in heaven. It's, it's not about economics. It's about the attitudes and the assumptions behind the economics. But there's a second problem when it comes to wealth. And James addresses this as well. And we'll be looking at it in subsequent weeks. But... Sometimes we assume that someone who is wealthy is blessed by God in a way that someone who is poor is not. Sometimes we esteem people who are wealthy because they're successful and they, they have lots of stuff and they have their lives together in a way that we do not esteem people whose lives seem chaotic and who struggle economically. So there's this attitude around finances that we need to get straight. There's something else I should mention, too. Because when we look at the Bible and we read passages about the rich and the poor, inevitably, the majority of us put ourselves in the category of the poor. But the actual reality is this. You and I are usually in the category of the rich. From this standpoint, do you realize that if you're watching this today, it is very likely that you are one of the 10% richest people in the world. And you may be thinking, I'm the poorest person on our street. 90% of the world would love to be able to afford to live on your street. As a matter of fact, I don't know how to prove this, uh, but I read somewhere that 99% of people in the history of the world are more impoverished than people in North America are. We are the 1% richest people who have ever lived. So when you read about the rich and the poor, be very careful about putting yourself in the poor category and ignoring the warnings and the instructions that are to the rich because we are very blessed. We have a lot and God has given us a lot so that we can be a blessing to others and we will unpack that down the road. But for now, I just want to take a look at verse 9 and 10. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since it will pass away like a wild flower. 
the status that comes with being rich or the lack of status that comes with being poor. That's what James is challenging. And he's challenging people who buy that philosophy. And he's saying, look, if you're poor, but your status comes from the fact that you are a child of God, that you believe in God and you're living for God, then you have that status for all eternity and you are blessed. But if your status comes from stuff, one day that stuff will be gone, either here on this earth or in the next life. And when that stuff is gone, then what will your status be? This should really hit home to the way that we map out our future, the way that we budget, the way that we invest our money, our time, our gifts. You know, Pastor Tyler, Pastor Caleb, and I are taking a course on stewardship through our denomination on church and personal stewardship. And it's been excellent. Um, there's been some, some great content, and it's really challenged this notion of simply thinking about generosity as money and understanding what living a generous life looks like. And that's the flip side of this coin. When our attitudes start to reflect God's attitude about resources and money, it allows us, it frees us up to be generous people and to understand that, that whether you're rich or poor is irrelevant to if you're generous. And so we need to understand how to invest and how to treat people regardless of their economic status and challenge people who are rich not to rely on it and encourage people who are poor not to be limited by it. The kingdom of God is promised to those that are poor in spirit according to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus perhaps uh, paints this best in Luke chapter 16 where he tells the parable of the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. Now, one of the remarkable things about this story is usually the rich man gets the name because he's special, and the poor person is just a faceless peasant. But Jesus reverses that. He turns the kingdom of, the kingdom of God turns things upside down, and so the poor guy actually has a name and actually has an eternity in paradise, while the rich man because he chose to enjoy his riches and make that his identity and his status, spend eternity apart from God. It's, it's incredible when you start to unpack what the Bible teaches about these things. And James wants us to understand that we cannot buy into these kinds of lies about finances and economy. We cannot buy into the lies of dualism and deism. We cannot buy into the lies of our circumstances determining whether or not we have joy. If we want to be a follower of Jesus, if we want to be made mature and complete. And those themes will keep coming up in the pages of the book of James over the summer. In verse 12... James says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive a crown of life from the Lord who promised that to those who love him. This sounds a lot like a beatitude, doesn't it? Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because he stood the test, that person receives the crown of life. We persevere with God's help. We trust God's wisdom. We don't just survive, but we are made mature in that process, passing the test. And then we are given status. We we receive a crown from the Lord. This is God's plan for you. This is God's desire for you. This is what James is calling us to. The alternative, though, is this. When we're tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when fully grown, gives birth to death. The alternative to trusting God and persevering and allowing the wisdom of God to direct our lives so that we can enjoy Status with him and a reward from him. The alternative is is spiritual death, is eternal death. And so this is a stark warning that James doesn't want us to miss. Wholeness versus double-mindedness. God's wisdom versus our best efforts. Perseverance versus giving in and being enticed. We need to make the right choice. And with God's help, we can 
you flip over to Hebrews chapter 12, there's a verse there that actually captures so many of the the themes and the, the words and the ideas that we were just exploring. Listen to this in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verse 2. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the one who makes our faith mature and complete. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus shows us how to live the life that James is talking about, how to face trials and persecution and suffering, understanding that in them there is a process that makes us complete, that prepares us, and there is joy to be had because of the presence of God in those times. And because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, he can help us persevere. He can sustain us and help our faith to mature. And notice that Jesus himself did not allow the world to give him status. He was willing to hang on a cross, which was shameful, which was the opposite of status in the world's eyes. When Satan came to him and tempted him in the wilderness, he tempted him by saying, I will give you status Jesus would have none of it because he, he only wanted God to give him status. He only wanted God to be his, his source of worth, value, and purpose. And so we see in Jesus the pattern and the path that we can follow. But because Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he can forgive us our sins And he can free us from the old patterns that don't work and and the sin that drags us down and entices us and ultimately kills us. This morning as we look to the cross and we look to the the bread and, and the juice, it's an opportunity for us not only to remember what Jesus did, but to see that it works. It works to trust the wisdom of God. It works to to be single minded and focused and fixing our eyes on God. So this morning I would invite you to take a moment and to reflect and to to examine your heart and to ask God, is there something in my life that is, is hurting my ability to follow Jesus? Is there something in my life that is being double minded it is taking control over an area of my life that I should be letting God have control in? Why don't you take some time and, and, and reflect and ask God to speak into your life? And if there's something amiss, if there's something wrong, let's confess that. Let's confess together. And in doing so, as a church, we will humbly come before God and experience his amazing forgiveness through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing forgiveness. We thank you for your goodness and your love, your mercy, your abundant grace. We thank you that we can come confidently before you and confess our sins and know that you will forgive us our sins and and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You'll turn us around. You'll put us on the right path and give us what we need to live well to bring glory to you. Lord, I pray that you would forgive our sins. The things we do, we know we're not supposed to. The things we don't do, that we know we're supposed to. God, I thank you that we can escape this guilt and this shame and experience freedom in Christ. We celebrate him in his great name. And we pray these things in that name. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his friends, this is my body that is broken for you. This is my body that I am sacrificing for you. I want you to eat this.
And after the bread, and after explaining to him that his sacrifice was for their benefit, he, he said, this cup represents my blood. The blood, which is the new covenant, which is the, the new life that I want to give you. It's this new thing that I am doing in the world, and I want you to be a part of it. And he invites us likewise to both experience new life through his shed blood and forgiveness, but also to be part of the new thing that he is doing in our world, in our country, in our community. And he says to his friends, I want you all to join me. And the Apostle Paul challenges us to continue to eat and drink until Jesus returns. To continue to remember what Jesus did for us and the opportunity that is in front of us and the life that we are called to until that day that Jesus returns. And what a day that will be. Well, my friends, thank you for joining me today for this celebration, this time of worship. What a day this has been. I pray that you are encouraged, but also challenged and spend time in the book of James. There's some great Bible studies in Right Now Media. Uh, read the, the chapters and, and talk to your friends and your family. Have good discussion about it. And as a church family, let's let God speak to us and challenge, challenge us and help us mature together. I trust you have a great week. Whatever God has in store for you, that you would experience his blessing, that you would experience his provision and his presence in your life. God bless you and go in peace.